Happy Mother's Day. I, I couldn't help but think about the uh, significance of the day. As it was mentioned earlier to me by someone, none of us would be here if it wasn't for a mother. And uh, we are truly thankful for the mothers in our midst today. I have some announcements here to make. Uh, Wayne, if you'll work your way up here and then, and then, well, you can, and then Beth after Wayne. The last announcement I have is uh, for the seniors. Uh, we are meeting this Thursday at 1030, and that uh, Helen is in charge of that, and Jerry. And uh, after we uh, do our sh short program, we'll have lunch furnished and that. So I look forward to all the seniors being there. I'm sorry I got too quickly away from here. I wanted to make an announcement about Tommy Sutton. Uh, he had a heart attack uh, and uh, had two stents put in and he's doing good. I talked to Debbie this morning. Uh, keep him in your prayers. And that uh, Martha Scott is not doing good and that keep her in the prayers. and. Uh, be mindful of our prayer list always and that uh, we are thankful for the Holy Spirit that instills in us to pray for each other and that and I would ask an interest in your prayers for them.
I do uh, greet you in Jesus' name and welcome you to Mother's Day uh, at the Community of Christ. Uh, today, as we worship God, we also want to honor our mothers. Um, I have been blessed uh, in a special way by two mothers in, in my life. Uh, Elsie May, who is my mother, and uh, by Sheila, who is the mother of our three children. And uh, as I look back on my life, I very clearly see that I have learned more about love and about loving uh, from these two loving mothers than from anyone else in my life. And I, and I know that there's a lot of you who would say the same about your mothers, wouldn't you? About the mothers in your life. However, let me, let me say that being married to a loving mother like Sheila uh, can be tough at times. Uh, it can be tough on the self-esteem. Self and let me give you two quick examples because I bet you can relate to them, fathers. Uh, our older son, Wes, uh, attended college at Auburn University. I bet that surprises some of you. Well, a few weeks after enrolling in Auburn, Wes called the office and Debbie answered the phone. A lot of you know Debbie. And Wes said, uh, uh, let me speak to mom. And, and Debbie said, well, Wes, uh, your mother's not here. Uh, I'll get your dad. To which Wes said, uh, don't bother. Dad doesn't know anything. <laughs> uh, Debbie has reminded me of that statement many times. But the truth is, the truth is that statement kind of catches up the feeling my children, my children, don't know about yours, but the feeling my children have about mom and dad. Mom knows everything, and dad, he doesn't know anything. They, they don't often call me, they call, they call their mother. And now that Sheila is a grandmother, she continues to, to keep me humble. Uh, a lot of you know that we have two grandsons, five and two, Decker, Sawyer, both live in Atlanta. And recently, Sheila and I went to Atlanta to keep two-year-old Sawyer so the rest of the family could be in a wedding in Texas. So on a Friday afternoon, Sheila and I went to Sawyer's uh, preschool to pick him up. And they escorted us to his classroom and when we got to the doorway of the classroom and looked in, Sawyer was on the other side of the room. And when Sawyer turned around and saw us, his faith just lit up with happiness, didn't it? And I know you grandparents, you can relate to that. His faith just lit up with happiness and he immediately just started running across the room and had his arms outreached. And so I, I reached my arms out and I watched <laughs> as Sawyer ran right by me <laughs> without touching Paw Paw. <laughs> Sawyer ran right by me and started hugging and kissing Nanny. It was a, it was a Kodak moment for Nanny. Uh, can any of you grandfathers uh, feel my pain? And, and what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say this. Uh, there's something special about our mothers, isn't there? There's something special about our mothers. And Jesus felt like there was something special about his mother. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, as he was dying, just about the last thing he did was to express love and concern for his mother. 
just about the last thing he said was, he said, John, take care of my mother. Now think about this. Over 2,000 years before the crucifixion, Jesus gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. One of, one of which is, Honor thy father and mother. And now 2,000 years later, hanging on, hanging on the cross, dying, Jesus kept his commandment. Isn't that amazing? He kept his commandment. He honored his mother. And today we want to honor our mother. Uh, in our service today, we're going to have two special readings. Two special readings. One, or all the children in, is familiar to some of you. It's, it's frequently uh, read at funerals. The other reading... Uh, a letter from a mother to her child is one that Sheila and I first encountered through the Alzheimer's Association when uh, Sheila's mom was, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. We'll sing two special songs. Uh, we'll all sing Precious Memories. That's a familiar gospel, a familiar gospel song. And uh, Roger and Ann are going to share with us Sabbath prayer. This is a beautiful song. Sheila and I thought it'd be very appropriate for Mother's Day. Uh, you'll recognize it from, uh, from Fiddler on the Roof. And at this time, we want to recognize our mothers by giving each of you mothers a flower. So Tyler, if you and, and Ashley would come up, and we're going to give our mothers a... As we are finishing up, passing out the uh, passing out the flowers, we want to recognize uh, two special mothers. And the first is our oldest mother who is here today. Our oldest mother who is here today. And if I am not mistaken, Julia May, you win. Julia May, you. Now, you're going to have to help me with this one. The youngest mother 
who is here today. The youngest mother who's here today. Once again, I'm going to need some help. Are you the winner, Michelle? <laughs> They're going to be till their age. 46. 46. Okay. Okay. Michelle, you are the youngest mother here today. Rather than clap, we need to pray for Michelle. So uh, on Mother's Day, on Mother's Day, I'm sure we, all of you are like me. We remember our mothers. I think about my mother. Uh, John, John related to me that this is the first Mother's Day that he can't call his mother on the phone and tell her Happy Mother's Day. So uh, we've all a lot of us have experienced that. Today I want to remember Goldie. Uh, because one thing for sure, if Goldie was here in Mobile and if she could come to church, would she be here? You bet, Goldie would be here. So, John, Mary, uh, Kevin, when you talk to Goldie today, tell her we all said Happy Mother's Day, and uh, and we miss her, and we miss her. Uh, now, as we uh, as we honor our mothers. Let's remember that most of all today we, we honor our Heavenly Father and we, we thank Him and we praise Him uh, as the source of our mother's love and the source of everything that is good and beautiful in life. Father, in the words of our hymn, we gather to worship you now with, with grateful praise. And we thank you and we praise you for your love, your mercy, and your, good, your goodness to us. Uh, this service, Father, is a, is a special service for us. 
because it's a special day. It's Mother's Day. And we, we humbly pray that, that this service will bless all of our mothers who are here and will bless uh, every person here in the way that they need a blessing. And most of all, we, we pray that all that we now say and do will please you and, and help build your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mother's Day is a day where we thank our mothers for all they've done and still do for us. We recognize God has blessed our lives with loving mothers, but we sometimes fail in thanking him for giving them to us. God has given me a wonderful mother and two amazing grandmothers, and I thank him for them. I believe that everyone today should take at least one minute to thank God for this wonderful gift he's put in our lives. Will the ushers please come forward? Heavenly Father, we feel so blessed today. We know that all good things come from you, including our mothers. May the money we now give reflect our love for you and help build your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to read 
that's 4 a.m., all the children in. As I read over this poem, I just, my mind went back. Um, most of y'all, if you don't know, I'm from a small town in Loosedale. Well, back when I was a little girl, you know what? We could roam the whole town. Everybody knew everybody. Mother could let us go. We could go from one end to the other. But we always knew that when we, it was time to come home, and we all were counted in. Of course, back then, you know, we all had supper at the same time, and we all sat at the table together. So as I, as I read this poem, and I'm lucky that I got to pick the pink rose because I still have my mother. She'll be 88, and uh, so it's very special to me. Are all the children in? I think, I think of times as night draws nigh of the old farmhouse on the hill, of yard all wide and blossom stared, and the children played at will. And when the night at last came down, rushing the merry din, mother would look around and ask, all the children in? Tis many and many a year since then, the house is oh so still, no longer echoes to children's feet, and the yard is still so still. But I can see it all, the shadows creep, and too many years have been. I can hear mother ask, are all the children in? I wonder if, when the shadows fall on the last short earthly day, when we say goodbye to the worlds outside, all tired with our children play, when we step out into that other land when mother so long has been, will we hear her ask just as of old, are all my children in? I don't know if uh, Larry knew when he asked me to read this that I lost my mother to Alzheimer's. A letter from a mother to a child. My dear child, the day you see I'm getting old, I ask you please to be patient. But most of all, try to understand what I'm going through. If when we talk, I repeat the same thing a thousand times, do not interrupt. You said the same thing a minute ago. Just listen, please. Try to remember the times when you were little and I would read the same story to you time and time again until you fell asleep. When I do not want to take a bath, don't be mad or embarrass me. Remember when I had to run after you, making excuses and trying to get you to take a shower when you were just a child. <laughs> When you see how ignorant I am when it comes to new tech technology, give me time to learn and don't look at me that way. Remember, honey, I patiently taught you how to do many things, like eating appropriately, getting dressed, and combing your hair, and dealing with life's issues every day. The day you see I'm getting old, I ask you please to be patient, but most of all, try to understand what I'm going through. If I occasionally lose track of what I'm talking about, give me time to remember. If I can't, don't be ner nervous, impatient, or arrogant. Just know in your heart that the most important thing for me is to be with you. And when my old, tired legs don't let me move as quickly as before, give me your hand the same way that I offered mine to you when you first walked. When those days come, do not feel sad. Just be with me and understand me while I get to the end of my life. With love, I will cherish and thank you for the gift of time and joy we shared. With the big smile and huge love I have always had for you, I just want to say I love you, my dear darling child.
precious precious memories how they linger and isn't that the truth and Anne, we all know this song <laughs> um, for most of us precious memories are synonymous with our mothers and with those who have mothered us and so in a few moments after I share a little bit about mothers and special ladies I'd like for any one of you who would like to, to share one of your special, precious memories of your mother and how she taught you God's love. But there's a catch. You can only do it in two or three sentences <laughs> because I would like as many of you as can to be able to share and you will have to come up here so all the people that are listening at home can hear about your, your mother or the mother person who mothered you. This past weekend, my sister Sharon and I went to Atlanta. Uh, we went to Atlanta to uh, attend our cousin's son's high school graduation party. Um, she had lost her mother to Alzheimer's also, and she wanted some family there. And uh, Sharon and I went, and of course we were able to stay with Ashley, our daughter, and Jim, and the, and the boys. And needless to say, I had a great time. Um, we got there around 5 o'clock on Friday. Jim and the boys got home from schools and play schools around 5.15. At 5.30, Jim and Decker left to go to Decker's soccer game, which was at 6. At 5.45, Ashley got home, rushing in from work. She ran up, changed her clothes, and said, let's go. And Sharon and Ashley and Sawyer and I loaded in the car, and away we went to Decker's soccer game. And we got to the soccer field just in time to see Decker score his first of five goals in that game and yeah <laughs> that was wonderful for me not because he scored five goals but because every time he scored a goal he would run over and give me a big hug <laughs> and I know all you grandmothers know what I'm talking about <laughs> uh, but I noticed you know during this ball game that Ashley didn't have much time to see the ball game you see she was chasing Sawyer and Sawyer is never still these days we left there at 7.30, we stopped to pick up pizza, we got home and Ashley was giving everybody their pizza, getting them something to drink, uh, putting napkins on the table. We ate and of course Jim had something he had to do with the computer, Decker got finished and he wanted to go play. Ashley got a phone call and so it was just the three of us left at the table and Ashley was trying to hurry Sawyer up, which Sawyer loves to eat, so that's kind of hard to do. And uh, then it was, uh, got to have baths, boys, and so she was gathering the boys up to put them in the bathtub, which of course they did not want to take their baths because they were tired. But you put them in the bathtub, and, and of course in the bathtub they were pouring the water out on the wood floor, which Ashley was, you know, you cannot do that, boys, we've got to quit this. And then as soon as they got out of the bath, it was bedtime, which of course they did not want to go to bed because Nanny and Aunt Sharon were there to play with them. And so they were a little late getting to bed that night, and Ashley got them to bed, and then she came down and she started picking up clothes and putting them in the washing machine and finished cleaning up the kitchen, and then she started laying out clothes for the next day, because even though it was Saturday, Decker had uh, four parties that he was invited to. We could only make two of them. <laughs> but anyway, so Sharon and I were exhausted. We went to bed. Ashley was still up. She still had work to do. The next morning at 7 o'clock, I heard Sawyer. So I got up and went in the den, and Ashley had Sawyer, and he was ready to play. So we played, and we had the best time, and a little later Decker got up, and we played, and then it was time to get Decker dressed and to get the birthday present and all the party things ready, and he and Jim left for one party. Ashley immediately had to leave to go to the grocery store to pick up some refreshments that she was supposed to take to the next party, and um, she got back in time to fix us lunch and um, put Sawyer down for his nap, and then she left for the second party to meet Jim and Decker. 
Uh, while she was gone, my cousin called and asked Sharon and I, could we please come by that afternoon and visit with her a little bit because she knew on Sunday at, at her son's party that she was going to be very busy being the hostess and she wouldn't have time to visit us. So we said, well, we'll just have to ask Ashley. Ashley gets home at 5 and we tell her that Tina had called and she said, let's go. And so she packs the bags and packs the boys, Jim bat out of this one. <laughs> and we get in the car and away we go, which takes at least 30 minutes. You know, anywhere you go in Atlanta takes 30 minutes. We got to my cousin's house and Sharon and I visited with the cousins and we had a great time while Ashley and Sawyer and Decker played in the pool. About 7.30 or 8, we loaded back up and we went back to Ashley's and then it was uh, feeding the boys and giving them their baths, which of course they were really tired this time and didn't want a bath. And then it was putting them to bed and they did not want to go to bed again, but you know, that's the way it goes. And finally, everything's a little quiet and Ashley sits down and she said, oh, I've got to get all my stuff together. I'm teaching the Sunday school class tomorrow. So she gets her things together and she has everything ready for Sunday. Uh, we go to, Sharon and I go to bed again, Ashley's still up. Uh, at around 6.45 on Sunday morning, I hear Sawyer, so I get up and I go in the den, and this time it's Sawyer and Jim. And Jim looks at me and he said, oh, Ms. Steiner, Ashley got sick during the night and she's been up most of the night. And I said, okay. I said, I tell you what, Jim, Sharon and I will change our plans. We won't go anywhere till about noon. You go get some rest, and I'll take care of Sawyer. Sharon and I'll take care of Sawyer and Decker. So he went to get a little rest, and um, I got to do what I love to do anyway, play with Sawyer and Decker. And uh, in a little while, Ashley came down. She was green. And <laughs> as she said, I, I, I remembered I've got to get someone to teach my Sunday school class. So she and Jim got on the phone and they found someone that didn't live too far away from them. And Jim took the materials over for this person to teach the Sunday school class. And I sent Ashley back to bed. Well, around 11.30ish, um, Sharon and I had to leave around noon. And Ashley, of course, came back down and she still didn't look too well, but you know, that's a mother, and she wanted to say goodbye to us, and we, we said goodbye to all of them, and we left, and we went to our cousin's party and had a nice time. And on the way home, I called to see how Ashley was doing, and uh, she said, you know, I'm doing great. She said, after I slept for a couple of hours while Sawyer took his nap, I'm ready to go. I'm fine. And she said, in fact, we're on our way, all of us, are, we're on our way to the store. And I just looked at Sharon <laughs> and I said, I don't believe it. Now, I'm not telling you this to share with you all of Ashley's activities. I'm just sharing this with you because I know that all mothers today have schedules like this. It's not just my daughter. Mothers and young women today, it seems, are busier than ever. It takes both parents today working to provide for their families. And so their lives are just packed and their weekends are not always peaceful and restful and stressless. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, today moms are professional career women, they're teachers, they're gardeners, they're cooks, they're chauffeurs, they're coaches, they're housekeepers, they're laundry workers, they're disciplinarians, they're nurses, storytellers, psychologists, musicians, creative crafters, athletes, wives, much more, all rolled into one person. And I think sometime today they call them super moms. But to add to all those many things, most mothers are their child's first impression of God's love. Now, I'm sure uh, many of you remember Irma Bombeck. You know, she was a journalist, and she wrote uh, a column, and, and usually she used a lot of humor in it. But I remembered one of her columns that she wrote that I thought was especially meaningful, and it was about God creating mothers. And so I wanted to share that with you. God had already worked long overtime, and an angel said to him, 
Lord, are you sure you are spending a lot of time on this one? Are you spending too much time? The Lord turned and said, Have you read the specs on this model? She is supposed to be completely washable, but not plastic. She is to have 180 moving parts, all of them replaceable. She is to have a kiss that will heal everything from a broken leg to a broken heart. She is to have a lap that will disappear whenever she stands up. She is to be able to function on black coffee and leftovers. And she's supposed to have six pairs of hands. Six pairs of hands, said the angel. That's impossible. It's not the six pairs of hands that bother me, said the Lord. It's the three pair of eyes. She is supposed to have one pair that sees through closed doors so that whenever she says, what are you kids doing in there? She already knows what the kids are doing in there. She has another pair in the back of her head to see all the things that she is not supposed to see, but must see. And then she has one pair right in the front so that she can look at a child that just goofed and communicate love and understanding without saying a word. That's too much, said the angel. You can't put that much in one model. Why don't you rest for a while and resume your creating tomorrow? No, I can't, said the Lord. I'm close to creating someone very much like myself. I've already come up with a model who can heal herself when she's sick, who can feed a family of six with one pound of hamburger, and who can persuade a nine-year-old to take a shower. Then the angel looked at the model of motherhood a little more closely and said, She's too soft. Oh, but she is tough, said the Lord. You'd be surprised at how much this mother can do. Can she think, asked the angel. Not only can she think, said the Lord, but she can reason and compromise and persuade. Then the angel reached over and touched her cheek. This one has a leak. I told you that you couldn't put that much in one model. That's not a leak, said the Lord. That's a tear. What's a tear for, asked the angel. Well, it's for joy, for sadness, for sorrow, for disappointment, for pride. You're a genius, said the angel. And the Lord said, Oh, but I didn't put it there. Maybe with this in mind, we can think about and better understand some of our biblical mothers. Picture the mother of Moses putting her small baby in a little homemade basket and putting him on the Nile River to float away to save his life. And later, as she was able to be his nurse, she broke the law in order to teach him the faith of his people. Picture the sacrificial love of the mother who went before King Solomon and told him that she would rather he take her child and give it to another woman than to harm the child. Picture Mary, the mother of Jesus, raising the Son of God and yet seeing him abused and tormented and hung on a cross. Picture Mrs. Zebedee, the mother of James and John, kneeling at the foot of Jesus, and as all of us wanting the best for her children, she asked Jesus, could one of my sons sit on your left side and one on your right side in your kingdom? Picture Lois and Eunice, the grandmother and mother of Timothy. When Paul said to Timothy, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Picture a small group of women, wives, daughters, mothers, 
possibly grandmothers, meeting week after week beside the river to pray. Today, I think we would call these women faith warriors. You see, they really had no reason to be there. The Roman Emperor um, Claudius had expelled all the Jews from Rome. And that meant there were not even 10 men, 10 Jewish men, that were required to have a synagogue. So there was no church. There was no possibility of having a synagogue. And surely, there was no way to win people's popularity for these small group of women to meet faithfully every week down by the river to pray and to continue their faith. And this story comes from Acts chapter 16 in the Bible, and if you ever have a chance to read it, read it, because I admire these women. And as I was reading it, I couldn't help but think of some of the women in Bamanet. They prayed and had faith just like that also. But in the scriptures, it only tells us the name of one of these women. Her name was Lydia. And you know what? She wasn't even a Jew. Lydia was a what we would call like a modern young businesswoman, like my daughter Ashley, or your daughters, or the women of today and mothers of today. She had a career. She was a businesswoman. Her husband had died. And when he passed away, she took over his business. It was uh, making purple cloth and dye from shellfish. And then she would import it. It was, that was, uh, you know, they didn't have different colors. And, and I understand this was a very successful business. In fact, she was very powerful and she was very rich. She was very honored, which was unusual for a lady in her day. And she had a large home with a lot of servants. But you know what? Lydia would not like to be remembered for that. That wasn't what was in her heart. What was in Lydia's heart was what she learned on the banks of that river. And I want to give you just a little background about that. Paul and his disciples were going to Asia to preach and teach. And when they got to the border to go into Asia, the Spirit of God stopped them and said, you cannot go there and preach. So they passed on. And that night, Paul had a vision, and in the vision was a man from Macedonia. And he said, please come over to Macedonia and help us. So Paul and his disciples loaded up, and they went to a small city in Macedonia. And you know what? When they got there, they couldn't find a place to preach. Remember, there were no synagogues anymore. So they hung around for about three days, and finally, it was the Sabbath. And they decided, decided to go to the banks of the river uh, to pray and to worship. And they thought maybe they might find some men there. Well, when they got to the banks of the river, they found this small group of women praying and worshiping. And that is where Lydia met her Lord. Through Paul and the disciples, they taught Lydia about Jesus and about God and about his love. They taught her how Jesus had been born and had a miraculous birth of a virgin woman. They taught her how he had uh, perfected the laws of God and lived them to perfection. They told her how he had died for his, his, his heavenly father. And that he had died for her sins, for your sins, my sins, for the world's sins. And how he had been nailed to a cross. And how he had risen from that cross. And how he had ascended into heaven. And that how he would come back and he would get her and take her to her father's home. And then the biggest honor of all happened to Lydia. She was baptized and she could serve the Lord. She was a baptized and redeemed child of God. 
And that's what Lydia would like for us to remember her by. Lydia passed on God's love and her faith to her children, to her household, and in fact, to many people in this little city. We know that because it wasn't long before there was a thriving church there, a church that warmed the Apostle Paul's heart with joy, even while he suffered in prison. Oh, what the prayers of a few little women meeting together can do. Oh, what the love of one woman can do. And so today is Mother's Day, and we want to remember our mothers and those who have mothered us. And so I want those of you who have thought about it and would like to share just a sentence or two about your mother or someone who mothered you to be ready to come here, and you'll have to come up here so they can hear you, and share how your mother has taught you about God's love. Y'all can come on up, and while they're coming, um, Al and all of it, I called a few people so they'd be ready, but anyone is welcome to come. Just form a line right here. Um, my mother, I wanted to share with you, taught me many ways about God's love. But one of the ways she taught me was that when she was a very young woman, a very young mother, and I was just above toddler age, she took me to church, and she took me to church every Sunday alone. We went to church in Atmore. That's where I got to know Helen's family. And then we moved to Bay Manette. Every Sunday, my mother dressed me, and she dressed and she took us to church. It was years later that my father became interested in the church and came to church. That is where I learned God's love, from those wonderful people in Atmore, from those wonderful people in Bay Manette, from my mother, and from feeling God's spirit in his home of worship. And you know the ironic thing? It was my father's family that had church connections, not my mother's. I thank her. My mother was four foot ten. And I remember her uh, as it wasn't very long in my life that I was taller than her and so she was always looking up at me but when we said goodbye she would take her hands and caress my face and pull me gently towards her and kiss me that reminds me of the Spirit of God the Holy Spirit gently touching me and letting me know that God loves me all know my mother and y'all know that she's always loved me and all of y'all I've never wondered if she was going to be there for me she always advised me and listened to what I had to say and a special time that we have is whenever I go to her house and we just sit around and drink coffee we sit at her kitchen table or we go out on the front porch and have coffee I have my special little mug and it's a little short mug and Mother has her big old huge mug, but she only fills it half full. I don't know why she does that. But still, we sit and talk, and this is a special time for me. My mother's always been there, and she's guided me, protected me, praised me, and loved me. I've never doubted her love for me. My mother is my mother, and she's my best friend. And I'm next, and she made me cry. <laughs> I 
I was born in the very heart of the Great Depression, 1933. That was a hard time, I'm sure. There were a lot of thorns and a lot of problems in life, and my mother was a very young woman when I was born. She was just 18. But somehow or another, in these hard, dreary days, my mother was always able to see beyond the thorns and the hard times and to enjoy life as every day. My mother, during those days and the years that followed, found time in her busy life, and it was busy, she had four little girls, but she found time to embroidery tie backs. Maybe you don't know what that is, but they were on the back of our unpainted kitchen chairs. She found time to quilt beautiful quilts that made our home lovely and pretty. She made colorful curtains for our unscreened windows and her apple box kitchen cabinets. She was a giver of joy, a possessor of joy, and she shared it with all that she knew. My mother sang all the time. She sang, I, I can remember, what a friend we have in Jesus, as well as I remember Jesus loves me. She sang as she went about her work, and she was full of joy. She told us stories of fairy tales. She told us about Santa Claus, and this made our lives full of joy, full of hope, and full of happiness. She gave me the gift of faithfulness. Her light was always there to brighten our days. And we did everything together. I mean everything. We sorted and cooked beans together. We made chocolate cakes and tomato gravy. We went to church together. She told us stories, and she told us always of the love of God. And it was my mother who shared the most wonderful gift she had, which was her love of her Heavenly Father and the gift of the gospel. These were her precious gifts, and she shared them and gave them to us. This was part of who she was. She instilled in me the joy and the hope that God's love is the most precious gift that we can be given, and that he has purpose in all lives, and no one is left out of the realm of his great love. At a very, very early age, she taught me the song, Jesus loves me, and this has always been a constant in my life. Joy and hope are lasting gifts that my mother gave me. As all of you know, I was blessed with two mothers. My first mother was the one that bore me. She gave me up, and the memory that she gave to me because of that was that she had enough love to give up her son so that he could have a better life than she thought she could give me. The second mother I had, I called mom. Mom gave me another memory, and that was that she raised me as her own, and she gave me the better life that my mother wanted me to have. My mother is Frances Bowers, as most of you know, and I have four brothers, which made us quite a, quite a rowdy home. Um, but one great memory I have of my mother that proved her love is if I had a nickel for every sandwich she ever made, I'd be so rich. I remember as a child she had the whole counter covered with bread, making sandwiches for me and my brothers to take to school. And um, 
that's one of my best memories. And also I wanted to um, tell Julia May that I learned a lot from her too as a young lady. And I love her too, as well as my mother. I have not always been the uh, intellectual giant that you see before you. Um, when I was uh, when I was young, I had a reading disability, a learning disability, and um, came very very close to being held back. Was sent to the resource room, the equivalent, in, at least in 1970 or 1969, of special education, and and. Uh, came home realizing that I was going to be um, held back and you know I remember the, the walk home and walking in to uh, see my mom and and um, she basically put me in the car and we drove to the library and checked out and I mean every Dr. Seuss book ever written and for the next what seemed like an eternity every day after school she would sit and and have me read for a couple hours and um, did that forever um, and, and rather than letting me go out and play and so forth and and was about a month or so later maybe two tested to um, determine whether I would need to um, go back to this resource program at the school where I was and she got me through that and um, I've always thought of that as probably one of the most important moments in my life, setting a stage for not only my ability to read, but also showing me the importance of learning. So I thank you for that, sincerely. It's very hard to do in two sentences, but I'm going to try. Um, there's a, a statement that I really like from Mother Teresa. And I think it summarizes my mother and her gift of love and faith to this church and how she has inspired me. Mother Teresa says, I can't do great things, but sometimes I can do small things with great love. And I think that's what she's taught me. I love her very much, and happy Mother's Day. But I don't want to leave just yet because I wanted to mention a couple other ladies that, that have mothered my son in, um, in this congregation, um, Joyce Evans and Jennifer Fleming, I love you because you love my rascally son, Daniel, and you had um, faith in him, and you gave him that joy and that love of God in his life, and you still do that, and I appreciate you for mothering him. Anyone else? Real quick. Ashley, Kaylee, did you want to come? I'd just like to say that my mom is awesome. <laughs> uh, we share a lot of funny memories together. Um, if you locked us in a plain white room with absolutely nothing but each other, we'd find a way to just start rolling on the floor from laughing. and. I think that those, those little things, those little happy moments that we share is a little way to show how God has blessed me with such a loving mother. Um, my mom is like my best friend. I can tell her anything and everything. And I'm happy that God has blessed me with a mother like that. Um, she would bring me to church as a child and taught me about God and made sure I went to a Christian school. And I thank her for paying the money for it. Thank you. I know all of you would like to stand up and share about your mother, but because of time, we're going to have to to stop now. I'm very thankful we have three generations here that stood to appreciate their mothers actually four because you were talking about barbie 
Uh, but in the end, I want to share with just one other thing, and I'm going to sit down. And that's the fact uh, about Lydia. You know, um, she just felt God's love so much. And she wanted Paul and the disciples to come to her home and stay with her. I think that's the way you shared love in those days. But they refused at first. And then the scriptures tell us, but she prevailed upon them. And they went. So it is my prayer today that every man, woman, mother, father, parent, child, that you will prevail upon all those people in your world to come to Jesus and to learn of God's love. And may God bless each of you. May you abide in his protection, his peace, and his love. Will you pray with me? Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, you have bestowed upon us this day a very special blessing, the blessing of your closeness, the gift of your grace into each of our lives. Each of us came into this world, dear Heavenly Father, different people from what we are now. But basically, we are that individual that that person, mother, helped to create in us along with you. And for this, we are so grateful. We thank you for the sweet and precious memories that flood us when we remember our childhood, the things that were in our lives, and the love that we felt there, the love that we saw there in the faces of our parents and our brothers and sisters. And Heavenly Father, in this gathering today, a group of your children have come we see the love for each other in each of our lives that's reflected in the love that we have for one another, for this great and precious gift of a loving Heavenly Father. We give you thanks. We thank you for mothers who taught us and loved us and helped us to become what you intended us to be. I pray that you will go with us as we leave this place today. 
that the memories of each of us, the memories of our parents, the memories of our young life, will help us to be better people in today's world. Help us to look at our brothers and sisters in this place with love in our eyes for each other. Forgive us things that we think harmful of one another, things that we don't always see with the love that we should. Help us to love one another as we have so graciously and wonderfully been loved by you. For we th pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is with great joy in our hearts this day that the precious memories that we have have been blessed by women who have served as good mothers. And Father, we thank you for it. We thank you for our fathers. But today, we remember the courageous love that our mothers have given us. And Father, I pray that you will pronounce a benediction upon this congregation that as they go this week through the power of the Holy Spirit that they can abide in you and you in them. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.